So let's start with the Euryarchia. Euryarchia means true archaea. That's, that's a bad name. Um, Euryarchia are pretty diverse when it comes to phenotype, but they do fall into these three general categories halophiles, methanogens, and sulfur metabolites. So here's halobacterium, natronobacterium, etc. Here are some methanogens, and then here are some sulfur metabolizers. Some of these names may be familiar to some of you. There are some folks here in some state that work on some of these organisms. You'll notice, by the way, there are no pathogens on this tree. There's not a single known archaeal pathogen. Nobody knows why. There are lots of symbionts, but no pathogens. So the first group, the, the ones we know the most about, are probably the methanogens. Do you have a question? So some of them have bacteria. Yes. And so, so that, that's a historical thing. Um, so something like methanobacterium was discovered before it was known that these things were bacteria. And so they, they kept the name bacteria. Um, more recently isolated organisms rarely have the word bacteria in them. You'll notice, by the way, that these organisms very often have Germanic-sounding names because the Germans were invested a bunch of money into um, isolating and identifying these creatures. So the most common phenotype in this group is are methanogens, making methane from small molecules, typically one carbon molecules, sometimes larger ones. And so the, the default phenotype, the most common one, is that they can use formate or CO2 or carbon monoxide. And they, they run it through this process. Um, basically, they attach it to a cofactor. And then they transfer it from one cofactor to another once in a while. But they serially add electrons to it. Yeah? It, um, it is not because the, because the ultimate product is released back in the new product. <coughs> and so CO2 and hydrogen are, are mixed with methanofuran, and you end up with a formal methanofuran, and you reduce it to, to formal, and then you trade off the uh, tetrahydromethanoterran, and so forth and so on. I'm not The carbon comes from CO2 or CO or sometimes formate. Where do the electrons come from? Hydrogen. And so these organisms consume basically CO2 and hydrogen and make methane. And so here's methane at the very bottom. They contain some unique cofactors, F430 and F420, that has some interesting properties. Um, one of them being that they're fluorescent, and so you can take a sewage sample, for example, and look at it under a microscope, and you know exactly who the methanogens are because they go green. Um, the hydrogenases here and here, F420 and F430 hydrogenase, are nickel metalloenzymes, and that's a reduced nickel. And that means that these organisms are excruciatingly sensitive to oxidation. They are extreme anaerobes. Because if you oxidize that nickel, the enzyme is dead and they can no longer make energy. There's one group of methanogens that can use larger or more complicated organic compounds for methanogenesis. They can use acetate or methanol, and they short circuit it. They inject it into the pathway here. Um, in the case of acetate, acetate is just a methyl group and a carboxyl group. You just flip the two, right? And you've got a carboxyl that you can feed up to the top of the process. And the methyl group goes right here to the first step, the te te uh, methyl tetrahydromethanoterin. And so you, you, you treat the two separately, and then they converge here again and go down. In the case of methanol, you put it on a coronoid, and then it goes directly. It's a very short pathway. The result of this, by the way, of course, these hydrogen steps are where you get energy out of it. 
And so if you're starting with acetate or methanol, you only get a little bit of energy. This is important because these organisms are what make the wastewater treatment process work. Because ultimately, all that carbon ends up as stuff like acetate, CO2, hydrogen. But it's this acetate that gets burnt through really quickly, released as methane, and the organisms don't get much energy out of it, so they have to process a lot. The flux is really, really high, and you don't generate much biomass out of it, which is what we're trying to treatment wants to do, right? You want to burn all that stuff up into gases that float away and you forget about it. Of course, this methane, you'd like to capture that and burn it for energy. And there are some places in the world that do that a lot. Methanogens are obligate, or nearly always obligate, autotrophs. They get their energy this way. They also fix carbon. Um, they typically use the reverse TCA cycle. So let's talk about some of these groups in specific. Um, well, so where do they live? Got to have stuff like hydrogen, right, or methanol. Um, you've got to have anaerobic environments. So sediments and soils are a real common one. Um, any, any of you ever seen a um, a, a will of the wisp? Out in the woods somewhere, and see one. These are it's like a glowing blob that floats around for a couple of seconds. They're little balls of burning methane. Um, methane has a really low ignition temperature. It's easy to ignite methane, and it's easy to ignite it at low concentrations in the air. And so it burns. It doesn't generate much heat. It's ignited easily. And people used to see these things and think they were ghosts. Um, when you go to a pond or something and stir the bottom and you get all those bubbles, those are usually just methane. And you can capture them in a funnel and burn it if you want. Um, in animal GI tracts, I, I'm not going to ask how many of you have seen YouTube videos of this. Um, lots and lots of animals have make methane in their GI tract. Um, ruminants are really make a lot of methane this way, things like cows. The big one, though, are wood eating insects. Um, have you guys ever you seen pictures of termite mounds in places like Australia and Africa, like big towering structures? The termites work really, really hard with airflow through that mound. And you might think that's because um, you would like, you want know, the oxygen, right? And so you do the termites keep in the ground, they eat lots of air, and so you have to ventilate it for that reason. And that's not the reason they do this. They do this because you have to blow off that methane. One of these termite mounds, if it rains and it kind of closes off the mud of the mound and gets struck by lightning, they go off like a bomb and will leave nothing but a crater and a dead termite mound. Those explosions will go deep enough in the ground to, to kill the entire mound. Uh, wastewater treatment in landfills. My brother works in the wastewater in the landfill business. He's a geologist. And the methane generated by these landfills is really important. Some places burn it for energy. More often, they have pipes in the ground and they burn it off this way. Uh, it's really important that that be dealt with because if you don't do something to vent that methane out, it's, it goes down into the ground system and starts seeping into people's basements. And there are beautiful pictures in Chicago of people, people's houses are crossing the landfill that are blown to smithereens. I don't like, you know, water heater or something. It's like, it sets it off. What's interesting is the houses are blown to smithereens with no fire. You get the explosion, but not enough heat is generated to actually ignite anything else in the explosion. Um, and oil deposits. Natural gas, about half of natural gas is produced by methanogens in the crust. About half of it is generated geochemical. And so these are deep subsurface organisms as well. Here's Methanococcus. This particular one is Methanococcus unashii. Um, Methanococcus are, are really amazing. Um, Ar Archaea, there, there are lots of cases uh, of something that's unusual in the bacterial world, which is flagellated cocci. Um, 
Lots of archaea are flagellated cocci. Methanococcus is one of them. Um, Methanococci in general are amazing because they are complete prototropes. What does this mean? It means they don't take any organic material in the cell membrane at all. They make everything. They have no amino acid requirements, no vitamin cofactor requirements, nothing. They can make everything they need. Their energy comes from CO2 and hydrogen. The carbon is fixed. They can fix nitrogen. They can fix sulfur. Their media is nothing but mineral water with toxic levels of, of, of arsenic and selenium, pumped up with CO2 and hydrogen, and made, made excruciatingly anaerobic. Usually you add sulfide or thiothionide or something like that to it. So it's, it's pretty awful stuff, and these organisms grow really well. Um, Methanocolococcus comes from deep sea hydrothermal vents. It grows at, at really high temperatures, about 80 degrees centigrade. Um, <coughs> it's got three chromosomes. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting organism. They're, they're mesophilic methan or methanococci as well, living in things like river sediments. This is methanobacterium. The kind of typical example is methanothermobacter thermoautotrophicus. These are long rod shaped organisms, um, isolated from any sort of environment that you might isolate methanogens from, particularly though. The GI tracts of, of animals. This is the, the GI tract of antigen. Um, also in compost trees. This organism, Methanothermobacter, was isolated from, let's see, municipal wastewater sludge. A related organism, Methanobacterium strain Marburg, was isolated from a compost tree. It was at 65 degrees. Why would a compost tree? Have you guys ever been to the composting facility here on campus? One of the things they do is they, they have to make the mounds a certain size because the energy that's producing those heats them up. And if they're too big, it caramelizes all the stuff inside and it can catch fire. Um, most of these organisms grow in, in what I consider the moderate thermophilic range in the 50s and 60s. The methanomicrobia, like methanosorcina, are the ones that can use things like acetate and methanol to make a living. They're mostly mesophilic. Um, most of them are autotrophic, but some of them can, can pick up um, acetate from the environment and use it instead of fixing carbon, because they can already pick up acetate to do methanogenesis. Methanosorcina barkeri is generally the methanogen that you find in wastewater treatment process. This group of organisms, these methanogens, are the ones that are related, I'm going to talk to you in a minute, are related to thermal plasma and the, and the extreme halophiles. Let's start with the extreme halophiles. Did I tell you the red pairing story at the beginning of the semester? You guys know what this, you know what a red herring is? It, it, it's kind of a false lead, right? Where does this, why would you call a false trail a red herring? Where does that phrase come from? It comes from the fact that peasants in England used to eat a lot of sulfur. <coughs> it's an island nation, right? And before refrigeration, the way to preserve meat was to salt it. And so salted fish was quite common in England at the time. And, and that salt preserves it. It pulls the water out, and, 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 and organ, most decay organisms require a lot of water for growth, and so it's a great way to preserve them, like beef jerky, right? But this group of organisms, particularly halobacterium, are heterotrophs, and they can grow on the salted fish. They are red, pinkish and red. Uh, it's because they have some photopigments with them. And so these fish would start to decay. They turn pink, and they smell really bad. And so the, at, at the time, in, in, in medieval uh, feudalistic England, the landowners were few, and the peasants were many. 
and trespassing is a serious offense. And so the peasants would use these, salt, these rotten salted fish to decoy the landowner's hand dog when they were trespassing. Carry one with them. If they start getting chased by the dog, they throw the herring in this direction and head from that direction, and the dog would follow the fish instead of the peasant, and they'd get away. And so that's what, that's what a red herring is. It's a way to decoy your landowner's hound dogs. There are lots of organisms that are halophiles. Most of them are, deal with it. The problem is osmotic pressure, right? There's so much salt in the water around you that it's pulling water out of your cells. Most halophiles deal with this by having some kind of compatible solute inside the cytoplasm. So something like glycerol phosphate or um, some sugars or something like that to keep the salt out, to, to balance that osmotic pressure so that the salt doesn't dehydrate. These organisms don't do that. Rather than fight, they join. And so they have high salt concentrations inside too. Imagine an organism with 5.5 mole of potassium glutamate inside in the cytoplasm. This makes biochemistry with these organisms a nightmare because you never know how much salt is like it could be illogical for these organisms. Um, one of the enzymes that I've worked with in the past um, works just great with four mole of potassium, but it, it's completely dead, only three mole. It's hard to get that much of a solution. Um, but you can't do enzymology with that because enzymology is all based on concentration, right? Yeah. Yeah. Concentration of everything. You can't measure concentration of these, of these high levels of salt because it's actually effective concentration. And all the water is bound to ions in these kind of solutions. Um, they, they don't like sodium, though. And so they usually have a potassium sodium antifort. They, they, they pump out the sodium and pump in the potassium instead. Um, these things are generally fac facultative phototrophs. So what that means is under aerobic conditions, they grow by heterotrophy, just like E. coli. Under anaerobic conditions, they grow by photosynthesis. And so when they go anaerobic, they, they turn on some photopigments, they turn red, and um, use organic material just, they can't fix carbon, so they only use organic material for growth, but the energy all comes from light. I flew over the Great Salt Lake once after a rain, because the rain's washing organic material, and it looked like a giant lake of red wine. It was, it was phenomenal. The Red Sea gets its name from this. Um, phototrophy. It's very simple. There's no photopigments. There's no light harvesting complexes or any of that kind of stuff. Phototrophy in these organisms is driven by one protein and one cofactor. Retinal, and they call it bacterial rhodopsin because it was discovered before the OR field. This is homologous to the photosystems in your retina. So in the retina, the opsins, when they absorb a photon, the retinal flips open and it opens a calcium channel, right? And you get an action potential started. And these organisms, when that retinal flips, it, it boots out a proton. So it's a light-driven proton pump. And that's it. It just sits there in the light and it pumps protons out to make a proton gradient that you do all the stuff you need. Not particularly efficient, but these organisms tend to live in places where, where light intensity is not limited. There are two kinds of halophilic archaea. Some of them live in neutral pH salt lakes, like the Great Salt Lake or the, or the Red Sea. Others live in alkaline salt lakes. These are called soda lakes, up to pH 10 or 10 and a half. As far as I'm aware, there's no organism that can live above pH 10.5. Um, have you ever been to a soda lake before, out west maybe or something? Lake, uh, lake. No, they're awful. Awesome. I mean, really, it's, it's like you know, a, a lake of Drano, right? It's really bad. Um, but the problem with living in high pH is, is you have to have a proton gradient. And if there aren't any protons on the outside, you're stuck. 
Um, these things are generally rod shaped or cocci. Uh, this is a this is a picture from Namibia that Alice Lee took. Um, this is a saltern. Um, I go down to the, the, to the Bahamas all the time, and you know, they have they used to, that's where people used to make salt. So, um, and so you get these red lights there all the time. Um, let's see. The other kinds of, arc, of, of urearchaea are the sulfur metabolizing thermophiles. I'm going to talk a little bit more about different kinds of sulfur metabolism on Wednesday. Um, most of these organisms are heterotrophs amongst the urearchaea. And so here's Pyrococcus furiosus, the habitat of Pyrococcus furiosus. Maybe you guys know enough Latin to translate Pyrococcus with a little artistic, artistic license, this turns into great balls of fire. That's, that was intentional, the folks who, the Germans who did this like that. Um, organism grows uh, optimally at 100 degrees. It grows pretty well at 118 degrees centigrade. Obviously, you have to have to do this under pressure to keep the liquid from vaporizing. Uh, this thing is a heterotroph. It's using um, sulfur uh, by anaerobic by sulfur or anaerobic respiration. So the sulfur is an electronic sulfur, um, growing on sugars, polysaccharides, peptides, etc. Um, because it can grow on peptides, it has to be able to hydrolyze proteins with choline in them, and that cholidase is a really important enzyme bio in biotechnology. Some of you may know in London here. Because it has a completely spurious ability to hydrolyze organophosphates like nerve gas. And they're using it to make foams to decontaminate in war zones. There's another kind of sulfur metabolizing thermophile, like Archaeoglobus. These things are, are also heterotrophs um, or, or they can grow anaerobically. What's interesting is, is that they do methanogenesis in reverse. So instead of taking CO2 and making methane, they take methyl groups from sugars like uh, lactose, right? That last group is a methyl group. Excuse me, lactate, not lactose. Lactate. They pump out that methyl group and then oxidize it all the way up to CO2. And so they use the same cofactors, the same enzymes, and running them in reverse. Um, interestingly, they, they fix carbon by the reverse TCA cycle, reductive TCA cycle. But when the genome came out, they turned out to have two resistors. So why would you fix CO2? But why would you have reviscos if you fix CO2 by a reductive TCA cycle? Yes, exactly. So Rubisco, the co part, the O part at the end of Rubisco is oxidants. CO2 and oxygen look a lot alike chemically. And so plants have this, have this side reaction called um, photorespiration. And they work very hard to minimize this for a variety of reasons. That probably is the main reaction in these organisms. You can scrub oxygen from your environment. These things are anaerobes. And so they're probably using these enzymes to, to reduce their environment to affect the well. Eliminate oxygen, just like people do with um, catalases and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, so it, it turns out that a lot of organisms that grow by hydrogen generation, uh, hydrogen bacteria, if they're making hydrogen, you can't grow if that, oxy if that hydrogen accumulates. Kinetically, you just stop being able to make any energy product. So it's things like um, well, hydrogenobacter or aquifacts that make hydrogen for a living, oftentimes grow symbiotically with methanogen. 
advantages consume the hydrogen. It's fascinating to see. Here's my favorite, one of my favorite organisms, thermoplasma. It's the weirdest looking organism in the world. It looks like an amoeba. It's bacterial size though. This organism has been isolated worldwide from one kind of environment only, from burning coal refuse piles. So when you, I, I talked about this before, right? When you dig up coal, you've got some that's no good, and you leave it in piles, and it's usually associated with phosphate-bearing rock, and so the water, rainwater leaches that, leaches that acid in, extracts stuff, the water, you get um, acidic water, it's heated, um, oftentimes these places get struck by lightning and they start to smolder underground and they never go out. So you've got these smoldering barbecues covering acres and acres of land. And the water that runs off of that is a, is a kind of acid lime drainage and that's where you isolate thermal plasma. That obviously is not a natural habitat. But what is? Probably the initial coal deposit deep in the ground. High temperature, <coughs> some water, acid environment. These things probably live in their natural habitat in subterranean coal deposits. Uh, these things also contain the methanogenic cofactors and some enzymes, but what they use them for, nobody knows. Um, They grow either aerobically or, or, um, or anaerobically by respiration using oxygen if they have it and sulfur if they don't. And they like to grow at pHs of about one, which is by no means the most extreme case of acidophilic, which I'll show you next time. 